Hi, I'm Nicholas Paul Breiswitz, the Director of Development here at the Long Now Foundation. And I want to begin tonight's program by letting you know how much we appreciate your support for our work. Long Now is a nonprofit organization, and every one of our projects and programs is entirely funded by members and donors like you. So thank you for helping us foster long-term thinking. We believe that civilization scale challenges call for this kind of civilization scale thinking. And this has been an especially challenging year for so many people and so many organizations, including ours. If you're able, please consider making a special donation to our annual fundraising campaign. You can make an online donation in just minutes by visiting longnow.org support. By making a tax deductible gift to the Long Now Foundation, you'll not only be helping an organization directly affected by this civilization scale challenge, but you'll be helping us help everyone get better at addressing all such civilization scale challenges. Learn more at longnow.org support. And please don't forget to ask your employer if they have a charitable gift matching program that could double or even triple your impact on long-term thinking. Thank you again for all your support. Enjoy the seminar. Hello, I'm Alexander Rose, the executive director here at Long Now. We are coming to you from the interval here in San Francisco, where I'll be joined by Nadia Ekbal, who'll be watching the edited version of her talk with all of us, as well as staying on for questions afterwards. Open source software makes up the underpinning of much of the internet, as well as some of the longest running software projects we have. Nadia has been doing research into digital infrastructure and governance systems for many years, and her most recent book, published by Stripe Press, is called Working in Public, and that comes from interviews with hundreds and hundreds of software developers over several years. She's going to be sharing some of what she learned with us today. Welcome, Nadia Ekbal. Thanks, Alexander. Everyone likes to talk about writing software, but we don't talk enough about maintenance. We've all heard the stories of developers toiling away in their dorm rooms, launching their apps to millions of users, but the day-to-day -day life of a software developer is much less glamorous. I've spent the last five years trying to understand the maintenance of open source software. Open source refers to code that's freely available for public use. Open source developers write and publish their code online with a license that makes it possible for anyone to use or modify their work. Open source and its predecessor, free software, have been around for more than 20 years. Before that, most software was made by companies and sold with a private license that meant nobody could do anything with their code. When open source first came onto the scene, it was seen as this fringe hobbyist experiment that would never gain popular traction. There's a quote from a young Bill Gates's open letter to hobbyists in the 1970s, where he asks, who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobbyist can put three man years into programming, finding all bugs, documenting his product, and distributing it for free? While Bill Gates was referring to the mischievous developers who had pirated Microsoft's first software product, BASIC, this same question has been asked of open source developers who often contribute to these projects in their spare time. There's a lot of research out there as to why open source developers create software, but if I'm being honest, I think those answers are pretty clear to anyone who's ever worked on something they love. Why does anybody do anything for free? Why do you paint or draw or write in your spare time? The answers to those questions are not so different from the reasons why a developer might want to write code on their nights and weekends and publish it out in the open. And as it turns out, a lot of developers wanted to do this because today, the vast majority of all software we use, whether websites, mobile apps, or online services, relies on open source code under the hood. Even when software is privately made by a company, such as Instagram, Washington Post, or YouTube here, the developers employed by that company will find code online that's open source, like the web framework Django in this case, and then put it in their own software. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're relying on open source right now. In this way, open source forms the bones of our digital infrastructure that undergirds all of our daily activities, not unlike the roads and bridges that keep us together in our physical world. Understanding the maintenance costs of this infrastructure, then, is key to understanding how to care for our digital future. You can see why the making part of software would dominate the conversation in open source. It's strange and compelling to think of our entire digital world propped up by the work of volunteer developers who write open source because they enjoy it. But as it turns out, writing new code is only one small part of maintaining software. In reality, the majority of time spent on software is not on making, but maintenance, which makes up, by some estimates, somewhere around 50 to 70% of a typical software developer's work. And yet, curiously much less conversation has been spent on understanding the maintenance of software. If you're familiar with open source already, you know that it runs on contributions from developers all over the world. A developer writes and publishes their project online initially, but once it's up, anyone can contribute to it by submitting changes to the project. These changes are reviewed by that original developer or by any other number of so-called maintainers that they've recruited and either accepted or declined. If you've ever used Google Docs, it's like suggesting edits, where someone else with edit permissions decides whether your suggestion will make it in. From an economics perspective, researchers typically explain open source like this. 
Developers are intrinsically motivated to make and contribute to software because they like hacking away on new ideas. They share that code because they get reputational rewards for showing off their ideas. And software, like other kinds of information, is zero marginal cost, meaning that the cost to produce it doesn't increase with more users. Said another way, if I write and publish my code on GitHub, the popular hosting platform for open source projects, it should make no difference to me whether 10 or 10,000 people want to use it. The cost to me as a developer is the same. While this all sounds great in theory, in practice, economists are basically saying that software doesn't have any maintenance costs, or perhaps that maintenance is just as intrinsically motivating and therefore just as free as creation. But we know this just isn't true. All software does carry hidden ongoing marginal costs, just not ones that people like to talk about. Remember that it's not just that anybody can use the project, but that anybody can contribute to it. And reviewing contributions takes work. Like any leader or organizer, only a maintainer can see across the whole project to understand how those contributions will fit in. This coordination work, to put it bluntly, is not nearly as fun as writing code, because it means maintainers are dealing with a bunch of other strangers' code, which, as you can imagine, is of varying quality. Think about the quality of the average comment section on the internet, and then imagine you have to respond to every single one of those commenters, and you'll get an idea of what maintainers often deal with on their projects. While creating new software is intrinsically motivated, maintaining software tends to be drudgerous, thankless work. Or as one open source developer, Benjamin Lupton, puts it, creation is an intrinsic motivator, but maintenance usually requires extrinsic motivation. Software developers are about as excited about maintaining old software as most people are about fixing their roof. You do it because you have to, but not because you love doing it. This is a graph of the number of commits, or code contributions, per contributor made to Bootstrap, a popular design framework used by an estimated 20% of all websites. As you can see, the number one contributor makes significantly more contributions than the long tail. Bootstrap officially lists over 1,000 contributors to the project today, which makes it seem like a community project, but most of those people have only contributed once ever, whereas just three developers have authored about 3 quarters of those commits. And that's just code committed to the project, which is usually the most exciting kind of contribution. User support, which pretty much nobody wants to do, is a whole other ballgame on top of this. User support is a significant marginal cost of software, not just for open source projects, but even big software companies. As a maintainer, if 10,000 people use my open source project, I will notice a difference compared to having just 10 users. I'll notice that in the form of more users and contributors submitting issues, bug reports, and questions. And as we can see here, the number of maintainers doesn't necessarily grow proportionally to your popularity. Developers didn't feel the pain of this in the early days of the internet because there were just fewer people using open source software. But at today's scale, these maintenance costs become much more serious. To put this in perspective, at the time of the early open source movement, there were just over 200,000 registered users on SourceForge, which was the popular code hosting platform at the time. Today, there are 40 million users on GitHub, its modern successor, a 200x increase over the last 20 years. And that number has more than tripled in just the past four years. The community dynamic that we're used to thinking of with open source, where you essentially have a hobbyist club of developers using and contributing together, doesn't work at this size. Instead, you're more likely to see a few maintainers running the project with a huge audience of developers who are using but not contributing to your project. Most so-called contributors are just casual or one-time contributors and see themselves more as users than members of the project's community. Just as you might find it difficult to have nuanced conversations with an angry random stranger on Twitter, a maintainer finds it hard to collaborate with an angry random stranger on GitHub. Faced with a high volume of low quality conversations, like any of us who are dealing with too many notifications or too many emails, maintainers have to prioritize who they respond to. Now you might ask, is it just possible to reduce the maintenance costs of software to decrease the burden that these maintainers are experiencing? Yes, to an extent, but there are limits for two big underlying reasons. The first is that code, once it's published and once it finds a set of users, never really dies because someone out there is probably going to keep using your software for an unreasonably long time. Software moves quickly, and so it's often thought of as fleeting or ephemeral. Your favorite website disappears overnight, or you log into Twitter to find that your newsfeed has suddenly changed. By contrast, our physical world moves at a slower, clumsier pace. If the road in front of your house were to be repaved, or someone knocked down one of your office walls to build a new wing, the jackhammering and scaffolding and the smell of paint would give you weeks and months of warning as things change. But software only appears to be ephemeral from the user's perspective, not the developer's. Software's roots run deep, and the maintenance of software can extend over years or even decades on a much longer timescale. A lot of developers know the difficulties of making software compatible across different browser versions and mobile platforms. Chris Zacharias, a developer who worked at YouTube, once described the pain of having to support users who were still using a really old version of Internet Explorer. 
he called IE6 the, quote, bane of our web development team's existence, stealing time from other important projects. And yet despite that pain, his team was told they had to continue supporting it. One day, as Chris tells the story, he and his team were sitting around in the cafeteria, exhausted from not having slept enough the night before, and they began to, quote, collectively fantasize about how they could exact their revenge on IE6. They decided to put up a banner on YouTube displayed to IE6 users that said, we will be phasing out support for your browser soon. Please upgrade to one of these more modern browsers. The statement wasn't actually true, and they didn't tell anyone at the company about their plan. They were just sick of having to maintain YouTube for IE6 users. But their plan worked. Within a month, YouTube's IE6 user base had dropped by half, and they were finally able to relieve themselves of their maintenance burden. Some of the oldest code ever written is still running in production today. The programming languages Fortran and COBOL were both released in the late 1950s. This is Fortran being used on a punch card. While you won't really hear new software developers clamoring to learn these languages, both are still in active use today, and not in half-forgotten software applications, but embedded in critical pieces of our social infrastructure. Fortran, for example, is used in scientific computing, like weather and climate modeling, while COBOL is widely used in government, healthcare, and financial systems, including ADP, the popular payroll service. The second thing to know about software is that you can never really finish maintaining it either. Software might be feature complete, meaning that nothing else needs to be built or added, but in order to continue running, software requires some sort of ongoing maintenance because it depends on other people's code to run successfully and other people's code keeps changing. I previously talked about software's hidden marginal costs, such as the rising cost of user support as a project becomes more popular. But software also has temporal costs, meaning that it requires ongoing maintenance to continue running successfully, regardless of how many people use it. Rather than a function of use, these costs are a function of entropy, or the inevitable decay of systems over time. When I think about temporal costs, I think of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, whose function hasn't changed in the past near century that it's been around but it still requires repainting, safety checks, and regular cleaning to protect it against the elements. In software, the equivalent of those costs might include things like rewriting code, upgrading to modern tools and services, and removing old dependencies. Code is cleanest when it's first released, because that's when developers are thinking about the project holistically and writing it from scratch. But as more code gets added to the project over time, it starts to become a bit of a mishmash. Open source projects are particularly susceptible to this so-called technical debt, more so than closed source software, because open source maintainers accept contributions from developers who might not necessarily know each other or have full context for the project, unlike developers who are working together at the same company. Thus far, I focus on how maintenance costs can be a negative or somewhat draining cost for developers, but there's also an argument to be made that maintenance costs are necessary to keep projects alive and pass them down from generation to generation. The Issei Grand Shrine is a Shinto shrine in Japan that's torn down and rebuilt every 20 years, a practice that's continued for more than 1,200 years now. This practice of tearing down and rebuilding serves a real purpose, which is not only to keep the shrine looking fresh and new, but also to pass down the techniques of construction to future generations. Similarly, software requires tearing down and reconstruction to keep the tradition of building alive. Fergus Henderson is a longtime software engineer at Google who once wrote about Google's internal processes. And according to Fergus, most software at Google gets rewritten every few years. He gave a few reasons for this. The first being that product requirements change to keep up with modern technology and changing user preferences. But he also points out that rewriting software has positive benefits for their organization, like trimming down unnecessary code complexity, as well as transferring knowledge and a sense of ownership to newer team members. So there are a lot of good reasons why software is never done. Like the Issei Grand Shrine, it's a process that never ends and one that involves passing knowledge from one generation to another. Despite its challenges, software maintenance shouldn't be considered a problem per se. It's just a part of the ecological life cycle. And so this gets to a really interesting aspect of software, which is that it can exist in either a static or active state. And it's important to make this distinction and know which state we're talking about when we consider the question of maintenance. Code in static state is like lumber. It's a dead commodity that can be bought and sold and traded. When we access code in a static state, we're thinking about it on the basis of pure consumption. The implication is that we can inspect it for historical purposes, but it's not being used anywhere today. But most useful software, and useful meaning relevant to humans on Earth in this present moment, is by definition code that lives in an active state. Code that's in an active state, like C, is like a living tree or a forest. Code in active state depends on other things, and other things depend on it to survive. This isn't so different from how any other form of knowledge works. An old book that's collecting dust in a library that no one has read or heard of isn't very useful to society today because no one's really using it. 
The ideas inside the book aren't running in production. They're being stored on a shelf. One day, someone might rediscover those ideas and work it into modern conversations, giving them new meaning. But until then, those books live in an archival state, waiting to be discovered. But some books are still frequently discussed and cited today, despite their age. The Bible, for example, is a book that lives in an active state, because it's widely read and referenced by millions of people around the world. Code is like that as well. Some code collects dust in static state, while other code is in active use today. A software developer named Jacob Thornton made a similar observation about open source a few years ago. Jacob is one of the creators of the popular design framework Bootstrap, whose con contribution graph I showed you at the beginning of this talk. And before I share his comment, I'll add a bit of context, which is that Richard Stallman, a longtime programmer who started the free software movement, which was open source's predecessor, famously said that free software is free as in speech, but not free as in beer. Stallman was trying to make the distinction between the idea of being free as in liberated versus free as in zero cost, sometimes expressed with the Spanish words libre versus gratis, a distinction that's meant to highlight how free software is an ideology rather than about getting software for free. So Jacob riffed on this concept and he tried to explain the problem of open source requiring ongoing maintenance. Jacob said that open source is free, not as in beer or speech, but free as in puppy. I think this metaphor is really good because it forces us to think of software not as a static object like beer, but instead consider the costs associated with its being a living organism, like a puppy. You don't just buy a puppy and put it in your house and be done with it like you could with a beer in the fridge. You have to feed it and take care of it and make sure it's happy. Getting a puppy, much like writing software, signifies the beginning, not the end of a new chapter. And with it comes all these hidden costs associated with its upkeep. Open Source's predecessor, the free software movement, was explicitly about maximizing legal and social freedoms for the code itself. The four essential freedoms of free software, which were first published by Richard Stallman in 1986, refer to the freedoms of code, not of the people who write the code. Again, they're called the four freedoms of free software, not the four freedoms of software developers. The last 20 years have nearly nothing to offer about how open source is actually made and maintained. In fact, there's shockingly little vocabulary out there that describes how open source projects and communities might differ from each other. It's like if we only had one word, business, to describe everything from a mom and pop shop to a Fortune 100 company. And by treating software as an object, we abstract away its true nature, the way in which it's tightly integrated with living social systems, and therefore ignore its hidden costs. This comes at a cost to open source developers' happiness and well-being where they're expected to maintain software basically forever, even though in many cases they don't get any intrinsic or extrinsic benefit from it. To go back to Bill Gates's question from the beginning of this talk, who can afford to do professional work for nothing? We rarely use code as a static object, even though from an economic perspective, we still value it that way. Code, like other types of information, is not a book or a file or a CD, even if it occasionally appears in that format. In each of these cases, the physical version is a form of artificial scarcity that's meant to help us assign a value to the underlying information. But the information itself exists independently of any of these physical formats. The author Neil Stevenson once described the operating system Unix as, quote, not so much a product as it is a painstakingly compiled oral history of the hacker subculture. It is our Gilgamesh epic. Unix is known, loved, and understood by so many hackers that it could be recreated from scratch whenever someone needs it. Code in its truest form is not a product to be bought and sold so much as a living form of knowledge, an oral history. So how then could we value code in this living contextual ecosystemic relationship? By looking at the people who produce it. Human relationships are a way to understand the true value of code, who maintains that code and why we trust them to maintain it. While this might seem strange at first, it's not so different from how we think about valuing cities, infrastructure, and other systems of human complexity. The author Jane Jacobs offered a similar approach in her 1961 book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, where she criticized the contemporary 1950s approach to urban planning. According to Jacobs, urban planners treated cities as static objects, considering how they should be developed only at the time of creation, rather than continuously revising their plans according to how people use them. The urban ministry practitioner Douglas Hall describes this as the cat and the toaster problem in his book of the same name. Douglas said that churches, neighborhoods, cities, and cultures are complex and interrelated living social systems. They're like cats. But as he puts it, we've grown accustomed to thinking of our social context not as living systems, but as objects we can easily measure and control, like a toaster. But the problem is that we still tend to think and talk about software as a static object, taking it out of context. It's why we have this myth that software is zero marginal costs, ignoring the complex human interdependencies that are required to maintain it. We treat software like toasters instead of cats, 
And so the value of open source infrastructure doesn't lie entirely in the code itself. Sure, we can say that some code is better written than others or that it solves an important problem. But over time, what was once a groundbreaking solution might become commonplace, or what was once an elegant piece of code is now a bit out of fashion. Right now, we only seem to know how to value knowledge based on its first copy costs, or that initial cost of creation. It's why we always talk about creating software, but rarely about maintaining it. It's why open source culture focuses on the intrinsic motivation that drives a developer to create, but not the extrinsic rewards that are actually needed to continue maintaining software. And this isn't a dig on anyone, by the way. It's hard to figure out the answers to these problems. While researching my book, I tried to understand how we appraise the economic value of public infrastructure today, like parks and bridges. And it turns out there's very little information out there, probably because so much of our physical infrastructure is made and maintained by governments. But we don't have a government of the internet. And if we consider not just so-called hard infrastructure, meaning the physical networks that keep society running, but also our soft infrastructure, meaning social norms, culture, arts, and institutions that give our society meaning, this question of how to value our digital infrastructure doesn't just apply to software developers, but to anyone who's engaged in the creation, distribution, and maintenance of content today. But if we want to understand how to support the ongoing maintenance of software or any kind of content, we have to start with this idea that its value lies not in the actual code anymore, but in the people who write the code. In economic terms, open source software is frequently referred to as a public good. But public goods are, to use two fancy terms, non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Non-rivalrous means that my use of the good doesn't diminish your ability to consume it. Think about breathing air versus cutting down a forest. Non-excludable means that I can't prevent anyone else from accessing the good. Think of a public park that anyone can enter instead of an amusement park that charges admission. And so open source is non-excludable because it's freely available for anyone to use, and that's one of its core tenets. But it seems that open source is not exactly non-rivalrous because as we've already seen, there are marginal costs that are still associated with maintaining software. So is open source code still a public good? Yes, but the solution I'd like to propose is that open source is not really one economic good after all, but two different kinds of goods masquerading as one. Open source code is a public good. It's a static object that anyone can access and use without diminishing anyone else's ability to use it. These days, a thousand people can happily copy paste your code if they want it without affecting another person's ability to use it. But the production of open source code, meaning the people behind the code, functions more like a commons. A commons is a resource that's owned, used, and managed by a community. A lake or a forest would be an example of a commons, where if everyone chopped down all the trees or overfished the lake, there wouldn't be anything left of the resource. This creates a so-called tragedy of the commons that you might be familiar with, where everyone acts in their own self-interest instead of the common good and thus depletes the resource. The production of code is a commons where the attention of maintainers is the depletable resource. It might not cost a contributor anything to open an issue or ask a question, and they might even genuinely be trying to help. But if a single maintainer receives 100 of these requests that they need to review and respond to, eventually their limited attention will be depleted because there are only so many hours in the day. So even though the contributor can't always see the way in which their request depletes the attention commons, each new interaction does diminish a maintainer's ability to interact with another contributor. If we accept this conception of open source, then maintainers hold a special place in this ecosystem. In conservation biology terms, maintainers can be thought of as a keystone species. A keystone species is small in population size, but it has an outsized impact on its ecosystem. If you imagine a forest, for example, there might not be that many wolves in absolute numbers. But if the wolves disappear, there would be cascading effects on the rest of the forest. The deer population, lacking a natural predator, would grow out of control. The plants would start to disappear because there would be too many deer and so on. Similarly, although maintainers are few in number, their impact on an open source project is far reaching because they're the bottleneck to everyone else's contributions. If a maintainer disappears, it's possible that someone will eventually take their place. And a lot of times that is what happens. But a project can't survive without somebody stepping up into that maintainer's role. If a project doesn't have any maintainers, there's nobody available to coordinate, review, and merge contributions. It literally cannot go on. And so valuing open source software and the maintenance work involved requires that we transition away from this idea of code as an object to be bought and sold, which is the language of what we used to call information goods and towards relationship-based ways of thinking about the code and content we consume. We can ask ourselves, if this person steps down or disappears, will the value of the project be materially impacted? If so, why aren't we talking more about supporting that person? To me, there is no concept of software without people. Like any type of infrastructure, open source is meaningless without understanding its present value to human civilization, 
we have to appraise its value in terms of the people who depend on it and the people who maintain it. An empty city without any people is a chilling concept to me. But in many ways, free and early open source culture is defined by this focus on software as an object, software without any people that stands the test of time. It's a beautiful concept, but I don't think it's actually how complex knowledge systems work. It's like the urban planners of the 1950s that Jacobs criticized. The idea that you can construct a building once and forget about it, or write code and forget about it, simply isn't a realistic vision of what's required to make and move these systems. Software is brittle, unreliable, subject to breakage at all times, an endless exercise in patience and failing over and over again. The developers I talk to seem very aware that all of software, and by extension, our entire digital society, is built on toothpicks and popsicle sticks. That software is always one undiscovered bug away from a critical failure. That what makes it work is not just the disembodied algorithms that mainstream media loves to write about, but one quiet, dedicated person who's frantically trying to fix your problems on a Saturday night. Those are the images of open source that stick with me. Stories about developers who are thanklessly maintaining software in these extremely prosaic ways. Staying up late at night, reading your issues, and trying to understand what's going on. Pushing a fix for a critical security vulnerability before anyone exploits it. And so I think understanding the maintenance problem of open source means bringing developers out from behind the scenes and back into the spotlight again. The focus on the volunteer communal aspect of open source makes it sound like it's about people. But remember again that free software is explicitly founded to liberate code from people. And so talking about this communal nature of open source, an idealized world where people are highly substitutable and anyone can swap in and out of maintainership, firstly, not only doesn't reflect what's really happening on the ground, but also tends to come at the expense of maintainers themselves. These are the people who've been entrusted with shepherding our digital futures. And I think it's a role that should be treated with more reverence. Maintenance is the work that goes into constantly updating our priors, shaping and smoothing an idea that's falling out of touch with today's environment, making sense of a static object in our current time and space. Although maintainer is a term that's commonly used to describe this role in an open source project, I actually find it to be kind of unappealing. As the writer Bern Hobart put it, Running a successful open source project is just goodwill hunting in reverse, where you start out as a respected genius and end up being a janitor who gets into fights. It's no fun to be a maintainer. As a creator, you're working on a problem that you're excited by, that you're intrinsically motivated to make progress on. As a maintainer, you're, well, a janitor for your code who gets into fights with strangers who have strong opinions about how you should run your project. There's a newer project called Roam that offers a set of tools for front-end software development. One nice thing to note about this project is that instead of calling their leaders maintainers, they call them stewards. I think steward is a much nicer way to highlight what exactly maintainers do for these projects. They're stewards of the land, protecting a depletable resource, which is the attention commons of open source. A question I keep coming back to is, how do we make maintenance seem not quite so drudgerous, but actually appealing? How do we treat the role of code stewardship with the reverence it deserves? Maintainers are not only cradling our fragile digital infrastructure in their hands today, but like the maintainers of the Issei Grand Shrine, they're constantly building and rebuilding. It's a task that seems futile in the moment, but is actually an act of shaping civilization, handing off our present knowledge to future generations to come. Thanks for having me and looking forward to questions. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, I believe we're gonna patch you in from where you are in St. Bart's watching the talk today. Uh, welcome. That's right. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great to have you. Um, I'll get started with some questions, and then we'll um, we'll bring in questions both from our audience as well as I know uh, Stuart Brand, who's writing his current book on maintenance of kind of everything. And I know this is one of his chapters is on on software, so I know he has several questions as well as Kevin Kelly. Um, but I think you know this idea of uh, you know how open source code is as much about the community of maintainers as individual creators, and can you say a bit more about how this this model really works in practice? I mean, it seems like people who write the code kind of then begrudgingly maintain it. Um, and I think people kind of have this strange assumption that by releasing it as open source that somebody else is going to uh, is going to maintain it. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It really seems to be that the, the original coders are the ones behind it, yeah? That's right. I think there's... Um there's this sort of understanding of open source uh, that hasn't really scaled with the times where we do think about these really big, well-known open source projects. And they do uh, definitely exist out there where they do have hundreds of active contributors. Um, you might think of something like Linux that has um, a lot of different groups of maintainers for the project. Um, but then there's this very long tail of open source projects that are smaller in scope, but still very, very widely used. And a lot of those only really end up having one or a couple of maintainers on the project. Um, and 
there are a lot of reasons why perhaps that, uh, certain projects don't end up attracting more contributors, but I think it's worth highlighting that that is um, that is a, a, a valid type of project to exist. Not all open source projects end up attracting this large community of contributors, but then that means that um, all the work ends up falling on one or a few maintainers. And um, I think it's the, the language that we have around open source right now as being extremely volunteer based sometimes obscures the fact that there are um, a few specific contributors, like the, in the example of Bootstrap, Bootstrap that I mentioned in the talk, uh, where it is extremely widely used, and they might list a thousand contributors to the project um, over the life of the project, but really it does come down to a couple of these individuals who are sort of like the keystone species of the project, and so I, it feels like it requires a little bit of a deeper look as to like who are those maintainers and um, how are they stewarding the project. Thanks. And so, I mean, why do we have open source? Like, where, where does it fit in this space? I mean, I think you, you started with this quote from Bill Gates, who obviously seemed confounded by the fact that it could exist. Um, and I know that it, it underpins so much of the internet and so much of the infrastructure that we rely on. But like, why, why does it exist versus uh, why would we just not wait for a commercial effort? Yeah, at risk of being a little bit cliche, I was very um, guided and inspired by this idea from Sir Brand of um, information wanting to be free, but also wanting to be expensive. And I think um, what happened to open source over the last 20 years has really kind of highlighted that, where uh, open source code became a thing because people just wanted to share their code. It's like any other type of information where, um, of course, we want to be able to release it. We want other people to use our stuff. We want them to remix it and put it into their own software. Um, and people can't help themselves. They want that to happen, right? We can't really constrain information and prevent it from being shared around. But then on the other hand, we see these long-term effects of what's happening in open source where it's, you know, making that information free doesn't mean that it doesn't come with any sort of cost over time. Um, and so open source is actually expensive to maintain. And right now we don't have a very clear business model for um, how does open source get maintained in the way that software that's um, shepherded by a company might have a business model behind it. Um, and so I think that's sort of the, the open question that people are still trying to address right now. And um, the the point that I wanted to make about ha how open source might really be two types of economic goods is meant to sort of address this question of um, open source on the one hand being something that can be freely shared around um, as a static piece of information without incurring more costs. But when a lot of people are trying to contribute to a project and contribute in maybe these um, lower value or more extractive ways, uh, then it's not, you know, it's not actually really costless to maintain. So we have to kind of think about um, information being shared around as a different sort of in economic good as information that is being actively contributed to and shaped. And do you think it's important that it's certain types of software be open source versus certain types of software being com uh, being commercial and, and not open source? I mean, it seems like we have a lot of these kind of shared commons uh, pieces of software ranging from, I mean, whether it's software or at least contributor based things like Wikipedia and then on into Linux, that clearly they have some very special space in um, in the kind of deeper infrastructure of what we do rather than, uh, you know, there's the, I think there's a reason why, you know, no commercial version of Wikipedia ever, ever made it. Um, and in a way, some of these, uh, some of these underpinnings of, uh, of the kind of the very deep source code behind servers. Um, do you think there's a, there's a reason and an importance behind that distinction? Yeah, it's interesting. When I started looking into this space, um, something that stood out to me was that open source is frequently discussed in the, at the a sort of more mainstream level, um, mostly in terms of its um, end user applications. And so we think about uh, software applications that are directed at consumers, um, something like Firefox, for example, that is open source. Um, and to me, there is very little discussion around the idea of open source infrastructure, like you, you mentioned. Um, Linux or other projects that are sort of behind the software that we might consume as users. So even if the Facebook app itself is not um, necessarily open source, Facebook uses plenty of open source in the making of that application. Um, and I think they do have sort of like two different paths or use cases. Um, I'm personally less, I guess, interested in um, deeply understanding the um, open source as a in terms of its sort of end, end user application um, use because I think it just raises different questions around, um, I don't think open source necessarily has a clear advantage in being open source for the consumer, but it's more interesting to think about open source code that's available for developers. Uh, because if you think of this sort of like 
wide community of developers, even if they're not collaborating on the same projects, uh, but just sort of like anyone who might theoretically need to use code to make something happen in the world. Um, uh, all of those developers are going to be wanting to share and trade around ideas and knowledge uh, that might be expressed in the, in the form of code. And so it's very hard to think about. Uh, it seems like it would be a disadvantage to prevent that from happening. It's why we have other forms of infrastructure that are also public goods. It's just more efficient to actually share that information around. Um, whereas on the end user application side, it's a little bit harder to make the case because um, I think for a lot of the reasons that we do see in open source more more generally, which is just that it is really hard to maintain um, and to find a business model for that that kind of maintenance. So um, I do feel like there hasn't been enough conversation around open source as infrastructure and uh, why it's so necessary for our entire digital society. Right. Yeah, I always find it interesting that um, you know it seems that there's an inverse proportion of how much money you pay for software versus how well it works. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I've worked with, you know, quarter million dollar seats of software for 3D modeling, for instance, that if you don't, if you don't also have the maintenance contract that costs tens of thousands of dollars with that company, it's basically unusable. Whereas things that are basically given to you for free, either as web applications or as open source software, they seem to actually work infinitely better and, um, and then don't have this problem. I, I, can you talk a little bit about that, about this, um, where, where free and or at least free as in puppy uh, moves to a uh, quarter million dollar uh, a year seats. Yeah, I mean, I think at least on the infrastructure side, it's sort of resilient when you look at it from this zoomed out perspective. Um, not thinking about any one specific project, but sort of like what is that entire fabric of open source uh, infrastructure that any one developer might need access to. And so there are projects that sort of die over time or the maintainer disappears and um, no one can, you know, the project is no longer being updated anymore. And if you eventually get to that point where people are still relying on this project, but no one is really um, is, is contributing to it or, or maintaining it, then there will be a point where developers say, well, I think we should start a different project. And then they might fork that project or they might start a similar kind of project and then sort of encourage everyone to start using that other project instead. Um, and so it does, you do see the sort of like ecological life cycle that, that happens um, where I don't think anyone will really be, um, I don't think I worry about some worst case scenario where there's like no open source available because people decide they just don't want to do it anymore. Um, but then I sort of like zoom in on any one specific project and I think about, well, what is that maintainer going through? Why did they disappear? And um, what was their experience maintaining the project? And I just have heard from so many maintainers that have had um, less than ideal experiences. And it's sort of um, unfortunate to me that it, it, a lot of them kind of end up in the circumstance where they're like um, so unhappy with the project that they feel like they kind of need to disappear or ghost. And it seems like that's not really the way that we should be um, rewarding people that are providing something of such great value to society. Uh, it's, it's sort of sad that they just sort of, you know, drop off over time. Um, and so I think like sharing some of those stories and bringing some awareness around that might um, just help bring a little more reverence to that role that I think they deserve. Well, I think that's a, a great place. Um, and we'll be pulling Stuart uh, Brandon after after this. But I think it's it's really interesting. Um, you know, there's many projects that like Long Now has worked on really where we found an open source project that was the beginning. It was kind of the right thing that we wanted, but then has been lost in maintenance. Um, but then, you know, we could maybe offer some money to that person to start to do an update to it. And I, I'm curious as to how you feel about where uh, we're paid work comes into open source. I know there's thousands of paid contributors to various, especially the large um, open source projects um, from various companies. Um, but that interplay of, of paid open source versus, uh, you know, kind of free uh, hobbyist open source. Yeah, it's a really complex topic. Um, and one that I think there aren't necessarily clear answers to, but just sort of like um, signposts or directions that we could take with it. Um, historically, it seems like a lot of um, open source projects had to be very big or very scaled out in order to attract any sort of paid development work. Um, and you would see these entities set up, say like a software foundation that would become a companion to an open source project. And uh, that foundation might be sponsored by a bunch of different companies. And then they kind of decide like uh, who gets to work on the project for in a certain kind of like paid setup. Um, now that we have a more fractured open source landscape and that happened for a lot of different reasons, but um, kind of the, the end result being that we instead of having a couple of these very monolithic projects, we have a lot of sort of smaller fragmented projects, which is not dissimilar to what happened to um, a lot of different types of content on the internet. Um, 
these projects are often too small to really justify having some sort of um, centralized entity or foundation um, that's backing the project. But you still have like one developer that um, is trying to figure out how to get paid for their work. And so I think it uh, especially starts to highlight this shift towards not just thinking about any one specific project, but thinking about the developer who's behind that project, because you'll sometimes see it's one developer who's just, you know, especially cr creative or prolific and might have created multiple projects. There's some developers who have created hundreds or even thousands of projects that are used by other developers. And so the question might not be, how do I support this one project, but how do I support this person who's maintaining a lot of different types of projects? And so I think the big shift that we're seeing um, in this question around um, people being paid for open source work is not just thinking about how do we pay for a specific project, but how do we think about sponsoring or supporting a specific developer. And I was really happy to see um, GitHub last year release their sponsors product to um, allow more people to sponsor open source developers or any sort of developer on GitHub. And they, when they launched it, they, um, they made it about sponsoring developers and not just about projects, I think to help encourage some of that shift um, culturally that we, we sort of need to like readjust to when thinking about what it means to, to pay someone. Yeah, nice. Yeah, we worked with GitHub a little bit on their long-term uh, kind of archive repository that they put oh, on Svalbard right. in the last year, um, just as a as an advisor on the kind of format and all that. But I thought it was a, it was a good effort to see that they're they're after kind of figuring out the long-term future of code. And for people who don't know, GitHub is kind of the largest open source repository of of uh, of code that people generally use as the platform by which they share their code and their um, and their commits to that code. How do you see uh, open source changing as a modern ecosystem? Where is it now and where is it going? Do you think there's a there's a trajectory in the way this is working? Yeah, I think um, a little bit of what I touched on previously around, I think the biggest shift going from thinking about projects and thinking about sort of like the code or the output or the the product that is being created, um, shifting from that to thinking about the people behind the projects. And I've been really... Um, heartened to see in the past few years an increased focus on talking about maintainers and not just sort of like this faceless group of volunteers that we just assume is going to uh, take care of code into um, into perpetuity. And um, so I think there's a lot more of these questions around um, what does it mean to support the individuals that are working on open source code. So I think that's a, a pretty major shift. Um, and then it, just from both a software and a social standpoint, this fragmentation that I mentioned of um, it's not just a couple of big projects anymore, but um, because so many people are participating in open source now and um, the way that open source is now consumed and distributed, you might have a specific software project that is pulling in hundreds of dependencies from um, other open source projects. And, and so it's a lot easier to just say, oh, I want this sort of like small snippet of code I'm going to put into my project um, more so than in the past. And uh, GitHub has definitely helped facilitate that as well. And so you can think of it as um, maybe like the breakdown from people used to only write books all the time. And, and then like they wrote maybe like articles or blog posts and now people write tweets. And so it's like slowly getting more and more broken down. But it also means, again, that I think the, um, the shift is not just about um, uh, the the piece of content itself, but the, the person who's behind it. And so you might similarly think about um, people share around tweets often without really even knowing who's behind the thing. Um, and so it becomes um, just a very different relationship between like how I as a consumer am perceiving my relationship to, um, to a small piece of code or to a tweet or any other sort of bite-sized piece of content. Um, and so I think it, it brings in a really um, interesting aspect now around the, the reputational questions. And I think um, it's been harder to really like measure that or make it legible in the world of open source of what is a developer's reputation. And um, GitHub has sort of made some attempts at that early, early on, but I think has uh, still a long way to go um, in understanding like what is the value of this developer who's making this contribution on my project because two co two different contributions are not not necessarily the same in value um, for me as a maintainer and so i think um, we'll just be hearing a lot more of that uh, and similarly in any other sort of creator ecosystem right now where people are interested in understanding the reputation of the the person who's behind the code or any other sort of content that we create excellent thank you I'll, i think we are able to bring in stuart brand now Okay, is this any better? There yes. you are. Yes, All right, great. great to hear you. All right, I welcome. love your book, love this talk, and you're really going after some fundamental stuff here. Um, Thank you. I'm curious, since the book has come out, which is just a few months ago, but this is a fast-moving field, um, 
Has his response to the book and uh, the talks you've been giving and so on, uh, have you come across things basically um, that you're now adding to what you have to say about all this? Oh, gosh. I haven't been able to even... I think I, I'm going to have uh, okay. to process it in, in, a, in a few months. Um, it's been interesting to see just sort of like the different concepts that people pick up on and the ones that they sort of want to drill more into because you never really know, I guess, when you when you release a book of um, which things are going to resonate with people versus not. And um, I've been very excited to have a lot of conversations with folks about um, the section of the book that focuses on different community types um, mm -hmm. stemming from different types of open source projects. So yeah. I mentioned in, in this talk tonight that we have this one term open source project to describe every kind of project, which is like saying the, the term business to refer to every kind of business. Like there are a lot of different kinds of businesses and there are a lot of different kinds of projects. And that was something that I've struggled with in my research over the years um, and wanted to kind of put some shape around in, in the book. And so I did propose a few different uh, ways of describing different types of open source projects and suggesting what does that mean for different types of online communities. And so there's been a lot of um, very fruitful conversation around that. And that's been a lot of fun to have. I didn't sometimes I guess like I, I worry. I was like, oh, gosh, I hope people like, you know, you, you like write the book and you're like, I hope that um, this actually resonates with people. And, uh, and so that, that was a really nice thing to have. So are, are you anticipating being the janitor for this book for the next uh, five <laughs> editions of it to keep up with changes in the software and GitHub and technology and dependencies and every other thing? I... I, I don't I hope not um, we'll see I think I think there's sort of um writing the book helped me understand better what I was interested in in a from a broader perspective as well in terms of supporting independent creators and it helped me figure out the thing that I wanted to focus on next which is working at um, a company that is focused on that and so uh, I think I want to continue I certainly am not going to tire of the topic anytime soon but I want to look at it from different angles besides just open source and so um, yeah hopefully it's a public contribution that uh, other <laughs> folks will, will refund. Oh, God. What's the company you're working with? Uh, it's a company called Substack that is a platform for um, independent writers, um, for people to send out newsletters, and um, it's just uh, it's been a really interesting journey in thinking about basically if uh, open source developers are trying to figure out how to get paid full time, um, we're kind of tackling a similar question for writers who are also. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a really tough question of like, if I'm a popular blogger or independent writer, um, how do I get paid full time to to work on what I love? Um, and so, yeah, so so much of what went into the book, I feel like I apply all the time at work. But um, it's nice to think about a similar type of problem, but from a different a different sort of angle. I've got one other question. In the research I've been doing, I came across a, a practice at uh, Google where they refer to maintenance as toil. Uh, the stuff you have to just keep doing over and over again, and it's boring and it's tiresome and you have to be careful and blah, blah, blah. And so what they're also looking for is ways to use better, well, to basically automate toil, to uh, program in such a way that uh, the toil other isn't needed or that they can now uh, put in a, it amounts to a toil fix. Is that something that, uh, that software, that open source developers are doing at all? Well, I'm curious, how are they defining toil? Um, maintenance, uh, sort of maintenance, janitor work, uh, having to you know constantly go and adjust the relationship with dependencies and all those not fun things, um, like you, you know, you know uh, Internet Explorer six. God help us, that was toil. <laughs> um, and their workaround, which was wonderful, which is to go out and kill Internet uh, Explorer 6. But um, in most cases, you got to keep screwing around with it. And they, uh, reportedly, what they do is, is find a way to automate that aspect of it. This is kind of what Kevin Kelly often says, is anything that a robot can do, humans should not do. So we'll figure out more things that robots can do so that humans can go on to the fun stuff. Any of that going on with open source? Yeah, I think um, there's been a lot of improved developer tooling over the years and sort of streamlining of these processes that have um, helped make it easier to review contributions and to understand what what a maintainer needs to do on a project. So um, I'm thinking about testing and um, continuous integration, which are sort of like these um, defined workflows for for developers where say someone sends you a contribution and you don't know the person, but um, GitHub, for example, or um, will tell you 
uh, whether the, the contribution breaks the test that you have set up in a project where it's like, oh, if oh. I introduce this code, then it's going to actually like cause problems in other parts of my code. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think things like that have really helped make life easier for developers and there's probably so much more they could be doing. Um, I remember when I was at GitHub, we also, uh, there was a, a similar sort of check or an automation um, for security vulnerabilities in your project where they would flag and let you know if there were security vulnerabilities and then you would, you would go in and review it, but at least you didn't have to worry about like going out there and finding that information. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it is fun with developers. I feel like they're constantly trying to automate themselves out of the work they don't really want to be doing. So right. um, that's definitely like a, a, a big part of the culture. I do wonder sometimes similarly to the email problem of how do we all manage too much email? Um, if you're certain you know, streamlining some of these processes, are you actually just sort of making it uh, in ultimately just increasing your volume long term because it's like, oh, now I can review 100 contributions and before I could only do one. Um, so who knows whether it's sort uh -oh. of like net positive, but uh, but it, it's definitely happening. Right. Well, I'm going to hand this off to Kevin. All right. Thank you so much, Stuart. And I'm, I'm curious. Um, I mean, you've studied many types of infrastructure and I think that, you know, we generally think of things of like roads and bridges um, and these things that taxpayer dollars go to, um, but there seems to be very little taxpayer dollars going to the open source community. Do you see a future where um, our tax dollars actually go to maintaining some of our digital infrastructure in a way that's similar to roads and bridges? It's a really interesting question. Um, and it's one that I've grappled with and I'm not sure where I land on it. Um, I mentioned this in the talk, but like we don't have a government of the internet the way that we do for um, physical jurisdictions. And so there are a lot of really interesting questions around um, whose job is it to, like whose, ta whose taxpayer dollars would really go towards maintaining an open source project if you theoretically have contributors from all over the world. Um, and I've talked to maintainers of projects who have grappled with these questions around, um, I live in a country where the average salary is much higher than my co-maintainer in a different country. Um, what does it mean for us to get paid if we receive the sum of money? How do we actually divide that up? Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's hard to think about which government would really take responsibility responsibility for any one um, open source project. But I do wonder whether there are things that we could do from a policy perspective that might make it more um, appealing for people to contribute to open source projects, either individual developers or um, companies where you can imagine maybe like tax breaks um, for supporting an open source project or um, making it easier for an individual to take a lower salary or lower pay to um, work on something that is perceived to be in the public good. So um, I'm sure someone who's more creative at designing policy than I might might come up with something there. Uh, but it's a certainly a, a really interesting, complex problem for open source. Yeah, indeed. And, and we'll bring Kevin in after this, uh, Kevin Kelly, one of our founders. Um, but uh, yeah, I always find it interesting, for instance, that um, you know, the idea that some things like our birth and our death records and our things that are maintained by, you know, cities and counties and states and, and, and federal governments, um, often we get sold these kind of proprietary packages of data management that they then get trapped in. Um, and the idea that, that we would not put these things in an open source format that we all have access to that has a deep future as well as, a, you know, a deep past in formats um, is almost criminal to me, this idea of like, you know, that you would you would possibly entrust your civil, in, you know, data infrastructure to something that's owned by a company seems very odd. Um, and so, it, you know, I know that there's some countries um, that have even mandated that these things be open source and some some proprietary companies that have even um, open sourced at least their for their data formats, on, if not the, the, the the software that underlies it. So that at least, you know, in a hundred years, if you're trying to access death records or birth records that you have a chance to do that. Uh, so we'll bring, uh, we'll bring Kevin in uh, to give us some other questions as well. Welcome Kevin Kelly. Hi. Hi. Hello. So I really, really enjoyed your talk and it was a lot of news to me. Um, and I particularly enjoyed your um, emphasis on the maintenance part rather than the creation, which is what we usually hear about. And to the point of Xander's question about maybe using taxation as a means, I was just wondering if um, things like UNESCO cultural heritage, um, I'm not sure who funds UNESCO, but there are all these sites around the world that get money and maybe we could also take a similar tack with um, these kinds of software projects and declare them cultural heritages that are being supported globally. Um, and maybe in a similar way that UNESCO um, sites are being 
So just as there is a list of all the UNESCO sites, uh, some of these open sources could be a UNESCO cultural heritage that we support globally. That is such a cool idea. That's really extending the um, the conservation biology kind of metaphor yes, to think exactly, about how do we, how do we right. conserve code in, in different kinds of ways. And I guess there's um, there's something there as well. I, when I think about the government and open source sort of relationship, I'm often thinking about specific countries, but there are, are also intergovernmental organizations um, like UNESCO that are um, that that straddle other uh, multiple countries. So um, that's a really interesting idea that I hadn't thought about. So speaking of countries, I'm wondering if you've noticed in your investigations any kind of regional differences about the attitudes towards either maintenance or particularly maintenance of software. For instance, the Japanese have a long history of being really good at maintenance and kind of um, taking it very seriously. I'm wondering if open source projects in Japan are treated any differently than other parts of the country, whether in Asia, India, or China, have you seen... Um, different attitudes or different programs and or whether or not this is you know like github and other things kind of an american centric um predominantly place where at least it's being um managed so so is it a truly global phenom and or is are there regional differences it's a really interesting question when i think about regional differences between uh open source projects i'm often thinking about language ecosystems, which I guess are sort of like the digital version of our countries that are kind of emerging for software developers. Um, and so open source is uh, definitely concentrated among uh, the United States, Europe, and Australia. Um, but we are seeing kind of growing hotspots of interest um, in China and in Nigeria. And so it's, um, I think, that landscape will look very different in, um, in just a few years, and it already is starting to look very different. Um, and as you were talking about uh, Japanese uh, open source developers, I was thinking about the origins of Ruby, um, where they do have this, there's sort of like a, a subculture within um, the Ruby programming language uh, because it was started, uh, it was authored by a, a Japanese developer, and they have this um, this acronym called uh, I think Minus One, which is Matt, Matt's is nice, so we are nice. Um, Matt's is the original author, and so they um, they have this sort of like cultural norm around uh, we are nice to each other because our original founder was nice to each other. Um, and that might just be a function of his personality more than culture. I'm not really so sure. Uh, but I do think there is sort of an interesting um, parallel or analogy to be made of um, when we think about uh, cultural differences, we're often talking about different countries or geographic regions in the physical world. Um, but then in the digital world, there's sort of like uh, definitely really strong differences between, say, uh, a JavaScript developer and a Clojure developer. Um, and it's really just interesting to see how um, some developers might be more conservative in um, how they think about maintenance, whereas others sort of lean into um, giving every giving away control very freely or welcoming lots and lots of different contributors. Uh, and it creates different types of software as well, where some software is sort of like minimal, but more tightly bound, whereas other software is very like sprawling and wide. And um, I explore some of those things in, in my book, but, uh, but I think there's a similar parallel to be made there around uh, geographic distinctions. And um, I have one last quick question, which is the Internet Explorer 6 killing it off, which is a brilliant hack. And I'm wondering if there's been much discussion about when you should let open source software die. And um, because people who are maintaining have kind of an interest in keeping it going, but it may not be the best for the ecosystem. So is there good heuristics about deciding when something should be let go and something new um, started or um, how how that kind of things is decided, whether this is an, just an organic or whether there's kind of a, a, a benchmark or, or something. Is it the consent of all the other software arising and you just go with the flow? I'm, I'm just wondering when you are dedicated to maintaining things, how do you know when your time is up? It's a really important uh, question to be to be discussing. I think there are a few different uh, let's not call them failure modes, but sort of like modes, I guess, where an open source project might um, die or fade away that I can think of. Um, one is a, just sort of a community loss of faith in the maintainer, maybe because their behavior is not um, desirable or they just sort of disappeared and they're not very active anymore. Um, and so all the users are sort of 
need to do something to regain control of the project. Um, there's another mode where uh, the the project is maybe just sort of technically not as state of the art as it could be. And I think those are maybe like the more um, complex questions because uh, all these projects are very like interrelated with each other, right? So if if everyone's software project is pointing to one project and someone wants to start a competing project, it's kind of hard to say everyone start using this other project because everyone is you know still still tied to the other project. And so it does require this very massive shift in conversation to say um, we should be using something else. And I've seen a few examples where maintainers themselves will say, I'm sunsetting this project and I've decided that this is not the newest thing anymore. I also don't really want to maintain it anymore. Um, and so you should use this other project instead. And that's maybe like the best possible path, right? Where um, that's sort of collectively decided. But uh, there are other situations where everyone is really tired of this project and, and they wish there were a better alternative but um, there isn't really any consensus or movement to create something else and um, yeah again I think it's just really interesting to consider these governance questions when you are talking in a digital space and not one with clear geographic jurisdictions because um, you might if, if we're talking about a public road uh, in, in, in the physical world there's you know there's a government that is sort of helping to decide whether we should maintain that road or not um, online it's really uh, it's kind of up to developers to self-organize and, and figure that those questions out for themselves. So um, I'd say it's different for every language ecosystem, every set of developers, but um, a, a very important question. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining, Kevin. Um, yeah, and we'll wrap up with a, a few last questions here. And uh, I mean, I think one of the things I'd love to ask you about, you know, both is kind of what are you, where are you going next? Um, but also, um, you know, uh, you published this with Stripe Press, which is a new publisher. I should also disclose they're a sponsor of this series. Uh, but they, I think they're, I'm, I'm curious as to why them and not some of the other publishers that, that you might have, have worked with. Is there, a, is there a new model that's happening here? Yeah, I think there's an opportunity for a new model, and I think Stripe Press is one of the most interesting examples that we have right now. Um, I had, when I thought about publishing this work as a book, I uh, was, for me, the most natural fit seemed to be working with an academic publisher because it was a reflection of, of research that I had done. Um, and I found that as someone who doesn't have a, PH a PhD and had not gone through sort of like the traditional academic path, um, it's actually pretty hard to both... Um, it's hard to find the the right uh, publisher to work with, partly because there's the question of your credentials and sort of like, well, who are you to be writing about open source in the first place? And I've, I've gotten a lot of that um, over the years from more traditional institutions. Um, and then there's also just this, this question of, um, do they really understand the problems that are facing technology right now? And I think what is so interesting and unique about Stripe Press is that uh, they kind of sit between both these worlds where both being a publisher, they are thinking about ideas and um, and they're looking for people that are writing and researching about interesting ideas to uh, to invite them to publish. But on the other hand, they're tied to this company and they're very you know deep seated in the world of technology. And so um, I think some of the most interesting research can happen at that that sort of um, that border between practitioner and um, and pure theory. And uh, and I think it would be really great to see more things like Stripe Press where um, where we can sort of like source some of the most interesting ideas that are happening in technology right now. Um, I, I felt like it's uh, open so the the issue around open source is something that mostly software developers really understand because they feel it all the time. Um, and and uh, yeah, so Stripe Press was really just like the perfect partner for that. Nice. And can you say a little bit about what you might want to work on next? I know you're on vacation right now, Gosh. so you don't have. <laughs> I, I don't want to push you too much on the spot, but I'd love to hear if you have thoughts of your future research projects. Yeah, so I, um, I, as mentioned, uh, over the course of writing this book, I realized that there were so many parallels between what was happening in open source and what's happening with content creators more generally. Um, I had really only intended for this book to be about open source, and then it was really over the course of writing it that I realized there was, it, it was the gateway to so much more. Um, and so I really wanted to be around that. I wanted to understand how online communities are changing and um, it feels like there's so much happening in the social web right now where we are starting to see the creation of not just the most public social platforms, but are these 
smaller, more intimate spaces. And I just wanted to be around that. And so um, I ended up joining this company called Substack to um, focus on uh, addressing this question of how do we bring more in great independent writing into the world? Um, how do we help writers make money? Um, and so it does feel like switching between this sort of um, being very theoretically focused uh, while writing the book to now thinking about how do we put those things into practice in my day-to-day -day job right now. So, uh, so that's sort of where my brain is at right now. And then we'll see what happens after that. Nice. All right. Well, and my last question, you know, I really love this idea of, of changing the title of, uh, of the people that work on these things from maintainer to steward. And, and it reminded me of kind of one of my favorite stories about that is that the, um, the person who maintains the Salisbury Cathedral clock, which is the oldest continuously running clock in the world that we have currently, um, is that he's, his title is called Keeper of the Fabric. Uh, which I think is just the most beautiful uh, title. Um, and it's amazing to me, like, and, and you can see in the interviews with him, like that, that title changes the way he thinks about what he does. Um, and I'd just love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on, on how titles can, can change the way we think about some of these maybe more mundane tasks. Definitely. Um, even, there's even, I think, over the course of how the term maintainer has evolved. Um, there's another term, core developer, that is often used. And I think uh, the evolution towards maintainer was helpful because it suggested that uh, this person is not just writing code, but doing a lot of things that are not about writing code, like um, maintaining their community and reviewing contributions. Um, and so I, I, I like that as sort of like a first shift. But then I think, uh, yeah, maintainer kind of often has this connotation of, well, no one likes to maintain things, even though maintaining things is really important. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I love the idea of thinking about stewardship or leadership or something that is, um, yeah, this more reverent title around uh, this person is being entrusted with thinking about this project in the long term. Because right now I think, um, when a developer feels like a maintainer, they feel like they got stuck with it versus like, oh, I get to be the maintainer or steward of this project for the long run. Um, Keeper of the fabric is a pretty good one. I can't really compete right. with that. No, I think it was McKenna who, who said like, you know, when we use this term, things like maintainer or, or sustainability even, like no one wants to just sustain their marriage. They want, right. like, they want, <laughs> they want there to be a much more exciting version of that. <laughs> so like, how do, you, uh, how do you make that an exciting and good term? And, and I think, I'm sorry, I'll, I will add one more question. I think uh, one of the things I did want to ask about is, I mean, you, you interviewed many, many people on this and um, you know, what was the demographics of the, the people that are doing the, the maintenance of this. I know there's, I mean, a lot of our software is written by one very specific demographic um, that while the software is used by everybody in the world. Um, and I'm curious as to you know, how that demographic looked to you as you interviewed those people and maybe how you see it going in the future. Yeah, it's really interesting. I. Um Originally, just even just like having conversations with developers, you kind of you know pick up on the on the demographics of the people that you're talking to. Um, the when I was at GitHub, we actually did a survey of open source contributors to actually put some numbers around this because there are very few numbers around it at all, um, and I was both shocked but maybe not actually that surprised to find that, for example, 97% um, of the people who responded to that survey were uh, identified as as male. Um, so you think about sort of like the the skewed demographics maybe in like technology industry more broadly and then uh, think about just sort of like a more extreme version of that for in open source. Um, I think there's an interest in, I felt that so many of the folks I talked to were extremely interested in um, broadening the circle of people that can contribute to open source and there's a lot of really, really great efforts around um, onboarding new types of contributors and um, mentoring new maintainers. And so uh, I know there's a lot of desire and excitement around that. Um, I think these things definitely take time, but I'm feeling optimistic. And there's there's a lot of um, reception and willingness and excitement of um, how to change that story around for, for the future generation. Cool. Well, thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for this talk. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing about your future research. Thank you thank so much. Thank you for having me. All right. And I want to thank all of you and our online audience uh, and look forward to our future talks that we have coming up. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. <laughs>